there were traditional wooden rat traps all throughout the locker room, all throughout the facility to make sure that it was driven home to the players that this is an opportunity to potentially get trapped. Don't take the cheese. Don't step on the rat trap. Especially not this week. Because there's a lot of trap games out there in college football. We'll get to those a little later in the week. Because today it's Monday. It is November 13th. And we appreciate you coming to us from wherever it is you're coming to us from. Welcome to Always College Football. I'm Greg McElroy. We so appreciate you guys coming and watching our show on the ESPN YouTube channel. And for those that have subscribed that have rated, that have left the review on the podcast platform that you use. We greatly appreciate your support that we've gotten the last few months, but we're not going anywhere. Yeah, just a couple weeks left in the regular season, but we still have bowl prep. We still have games. We still have signing day. We still have a lot to look forward to. And of course, the coaching carousel, which is already getting underway in a couple places like Starkville, Mississippi and College Station, Texas. So we have a lot of takeaways that we want to get to today. We're going to talk about Michigan. We're going to talk about Georgia. We're going to talk about Penn State. We're going to talk about Alabama. We're going to talk about Jimbo Fisher. We're going to talk about the Big 12, which is chaotic. We're going to talk about Texas. We're going to get to a bunch of different takeaways from the weekend, including Washington, including the SEC coaching hot seat, which is not something we ever like to talk about, but it is a necessary evil at this time of the year. I'm even going to give you a bonus takeaway as well that you probably don't want to miss here in just a little bit. So let's not waste any time. We start Monday by ranking our top six teams. And here's how I have them here after week number 10. We'll get things kicked off with the top six. We always do. And I always do this, and I know it came under much scrutiny last week. I do it based on eye test, okay? So the way I sort them is exclusively based on who I think would win against everybody else right now. And I do have to naturally factor in how teams have played up to this point. Resume is always a a minimal factor, and I try to group teams accordingly. But I group them basically by the eye test once you get beyond how many losses a team has. So this is how I have them ranked currently. At number one, making a change at the top. It was Michigan. Now it's Georgia, which is weird because Michigan coming off of their best win of the season and their biggest moment, biggest platform of the season. Well, Georgia also had a pretty big moment as well against a team that was ranked comparably alongside Penn State. And they did so in resounding fashion with a defense that is steadily improving. We will talk about Georgia and we'll talk about Michigan momentarily in our takeaways. But I have Georgia at the top now, followed closely by the Wolverines. At number three, I have Florida State. I was in person watching that Florida State game last weekend, calling the Miami game, and I continued to be really impressed with this group across the board. What was most impressive to me was their defensive performance. I know the offense has juice. I know they have great potential at wide receiver. Jordan Travis is and should be a Heisman Trophy contender. Running backs are elite. Offensive line is fine. They're fine. Not super elite, but they're fine. And then you look, I think defensively, though, as a group, probably doesn't get enough credit in the second half of that football game. They had the surprise onside kick early, so they gave up three points early, and then they really only allowed one play. So it was an impressive performance defensively from the Florida State Seminoles. I have them at three. At number four, I have the Ohio State Buckeyes. Moving them up a spot, I had them at five last week, citing their inconsistencies offensively. And I'm not going to draw a ton of conclusions against Michigan State on what I think Ohio State could do down the road, but that was a complete offensive performance by their standards. They've been up and down on that side of the ball. They went out and they showcased an offense that has some real firepower, so I'm putting them at my number four spot at the moment. I think they are improving drastically as the season now is maturing here in November. At number five, it's Washington, another nail-biter, not a real dominant performance on the offensive side, they they were good. They were solid against a stingy Utah defense, but it was really the defense for Washington in the second half that turned the tide for them to give them their 10th win of the season. I love Washington. I do. But you got to wonder if these close calls are going to take a toll, especially knowing what they have here in the next two weeks. The Apple Cup is looking more gettable with what Washington State's doing, but big one this weekend against Oregon State. And we'll talk about that here in just a minute. And at number six, the coveted number six spot. I'm still keeping the Oregon Ducks there for now. 
I think Alabama has a really good case to be made for that number six spot. They've improved greatly over the last month of the season. I'll talk about that again here in a minute. But I have to keep Oregon in right now. They've been a little bit more consistent up to this point. I know the performance against Washington is looming. They'll likely get another chance. They can hold serve the next couple of weeks to get another shot at the Washington Huskies. But I'm keeping Oregon at six for now as the, not, as the highest ranked one loss team when you factor in just how good they've looked in the performances that they've had up to this point of the season. Have you ever dreamed of hitting the road in your very own customized Mercedes-Benz Sprinter? Follow college football all season long by hitting all the biggest games in college football's most celebrated stadiums. At ESPN, we dreamed that dream, and with the help of Mercedes-Benz, we made it happen. This year, our very own Jen Latta has teamed up with Mercedes-Benz designers to create a road-ready, fully functional, state-of-the-art podcast studio on wheels. The ride is pure Mercedes-Benz with all-wheel drive and the latest driver assistance, safety, and tech. The podcast studio must be seen and heard to be believed. A spacious and chill conversation space with mics, camera, and mixing board to capture the action. On board, Jen Latta will be interviewing some of the biggest names in college football. All points to Mercedes-Benz for always bringing some extra. Out back of the Sprinter, they're innovating, pushing the science of the tailgate, complete with grill, cooler, TV monitors, and more. This is hashtag van life meets the fan life. To get an inside look to this one-of-a-kind, blow-your-mind collaboration came together, visit mbvans.com slash Sprinter Labs. The Mercedes-Benz ESPN College Football Podcast Sprinter coming soon to a game near you. Takeaway number one, the Michigan Wolverines just bullied a bully. They have two significant hurdles left on their schedule. They just cleared one of them, and they did so in resounding fashion. They really didn't have to do a lot in their first nine games of the year. It was solid. It was professional. It was steady. They dominated their opponents by about four touchdowns a pop. <laughs> didn't feel at any point as if Michigan was ever really stressed in the first nine games of the season. But here they are going to Happy Valley in the midst of chaos and the mis- midst of dif- dysfunction and misinformation and guys are going to be there. They're not going to be there. We're going to get a ruling from a judge and Coach Harbaugh is going to be on the sideline and he's not going to be on the sideline because they can't get the ruling and they can't get the meeting until next Friday. And it's everything pointed to Michigan being a mess on Saturday. It did. I mean, everything circumstantially surrounding the program would have led to me anticipating them being less than their stellar self. They're humans. How could it not have an impact on your performance? How could it not have an impact on on your preparation? All of that is is a difficult thing to compartmentalize. And we've talked already over the past few weeks that great players and great teams are able to compartmentalize the noise to execute at a high level on the field. But here's what was most impressive about the performance. The fact that they ran the ball 46 times in the ballgame, including their first 18 plays of the second half. Now, this has been a team, and we've talked about J.J. McCarthy's growth. We've talked about how much he has really been the focal point of an offense that can now beat you, not just on the ground like they were able to do the last couple of years, but they can also beat you through the air. And they basically said, JJ, we love you. I know you have a Heisman Trophy campaign that we're in the midst of. We would love for you to win the Heisman Trophy by padding your stats and giving you opportunities, but we're going to we're going to avoid that because of how Penn State can rush the quarterback, how they can apply pressure. Let's just run it right at them and see if they can stop it. They stuck to their plan. Even on third downs, they were willing to run the football, and they found a lot of success in doing it. They did not attempt to pass in the final 37 minutes of the ball game. They did attempt one, but it resulted in a pass interference penalty. That is domination. When a team knows you're going to run the football, you run the football, and they still can't stop you. That is domination. Blake Corum had a really productive day, 145 and a couple touchdowns. They finished with up with 227 
rushing yards against a defense that I have great respect for. We can say what we want about Penn State's offense, and we'll, we'll get to them in just a moment. But that's a good defense, and that's a really good front seven. And while it wasn't the 400-plus that they had a year ago, 227 against that group that has physically matured drastically is significant. J.J. McCarthy threw for just 60 yards and attempted just that one pass in the second half that I told you about that led to the pass interference. To think that they were able to just say, you know what, forget about it. Your strength is rushing the passer. Your strength is your athleticism. We're going to take it right to you. We're going to show you who's, who's the boss. It was amazing. And then defensively, and none of us are going to sit here and say that Penn State's an elite offensive unit. Far from it. Drew Aller had nothing going for the most part. Just 10 of 22 for 70 yards and a touchdown. He had the 11-yard score as well. But I'm not real convinced that this defense is any different than they've been the last couple of years. Is there that take-over-the-game guy that – is Aiden Hutchinson, or like we've seen from Ohio State, one of the Bosa's, or or Chase Young. There's not that just one, hey, I'm going to take over the game. Here I am on defense. You better learn how to stop me. But my goodness, collectively, they're so good. They're so deep. They rotate a bunch of guys. Guys in the last couple of weeks have lost good players. Hey, guess what? Doesn't matter. Next man up. They don't skip a beat. So very, very impressed with Michigan on the defensive side, but I can't say that was really all that surprising. The most surprising takeaway of the game is that they ran the ball with that kind of efficiency with absolutely no care whatsoever about trying to create balance offensively, and it worked in convincing fashion. Takeaway number two, Georgia's best is still better than anyone, which is probably why just a moment ago I put them at number one in my rankings. We haven't heard a lot from Kendall Milton. He's had kind of a quiet year, has had some injuries, and he goes for a career-high 127 and a couple touchdowns. Dejon Edwards added nearly 60 on the ground and a couple touchdowns for sure. And then, yeah, he put the freshman in. Andrew Paul throws in another rushing touchdown and 32 yards. We knew that they could throw the football. That's been established. We, we've seen them throwing the ball with a lot of efficiency all year long. But now with... I guess the run game starting to pick up. This group collectively is going from good to potentially elite. And I know Ole Miss is is nothing. They're not a brick wall defensively. I'm not saying anything that you guys don't know. While they're improved in parts on that side of the ball, and I'll explain just how improved they are. I mean, they are. They're, They're significantly improved. I mean, Ole Miss came into... The game on Saturday ranked fifth in the SEC in yards per play given up defensively. That, that's pretty good. You're in the top half of a league that's got some decent defenses. Well, Georgia's first team averaged about 10 and a half yards per play. Carson Beck continuing to make great decisions, throwing the ball on the intermediate stuff was amazing. Uh, he finished up 18 to 25 for 306 and a couple touchdowns. Did have the pick but still a really solid performance for the quarterback. A guy that was a question mark coming into the season has been their most consistent player from start to finish, given the fact that Brock Bowers has had to miss some time the last couple weeks. But he returned, had the touchdown, finished with just three catches, wasn't a huge impact on the passing game. The receivers did their part as well. But Brock Bowers, he looked like, his old self. I mean, given the fact that he was 26 days removed from a tightrope procedure, he was blocking pretty well. He was getting in and out of his breaks and creating some separations. He was make, making some guys miss as they tried to tackle him. He looked healthy and imagine he's probably going to be a little better next week and better the week after that. And then he'll be back to his old self when he takes the field against Alabama in the SEC championship game. The offense has been good, but the probably the biggest takeaway from this performance was that that was the Georgia defense that we've been expecting all year long. Now, you can say what you want about their personnel, how many guys that will get drafted, how many great players they have on that side of the ball. I I agree with all that. They'll have a lot of pros on that defense, but they haven't been as good as they were in 2022 and 2021. Well, here they are, mid-November, and they're starting to round into form, and, and they might even be playing their best football. 
And you look at just where they were. From early in the second quarter to the end of the third quarter, there were six possessions for the Ole Miss team. And they had a combined 19 yards on 21 plays. <laughs> it's pretty dang impressive when you think about it. Hey, the opening drive for Ole Miss was great. They went right down the field, they scored. They were the fifth team, by the way, this year to score an opening drive touchdown against Georgia. But after that, it didn't look very good. Yeah, they controlled the line of scrimmage initially, but then Georgia made a couple adjustments, a couple tweaks. They really f- forced them to kind of throw the ball through the air and Ole Miss couldn't do it. Once they took away the run game, Ole Miss became a little one-dimensional and there wasn't much to do there offensively for Jackson Dart and company. So that is what I'm expecting from Georgia on that side of the ball moving forward. If they can play that well, offensively efficient as they well as they did offensively, complement the passing attack because let's acknowledge the fact that this group is a drop back passing team. That's who they are. They're not the Georgia Bulldogs led by Sony Michelle, Nick Chubb, Todd Gurley. They're not the downhill rushing attack that they've been in the past. This is a drop back passing team that's going to win because of their quarterbacks and weapons. And they're going to be able to complement that passing game with the run game. Not the other way around. You're not complimenting the run game with the pass game. And that's okay. So they've tweaked and they've adjusted a little bit and they're highlighting their strengths. But the defense now taking the strides necessary to play at a championship level is really encouraging. Say what you want about Ole Miss. They're pretty good on offense. And they didn't look that way against the Georgia defense that is clearly improving on a week-to-week basis. Speaking of improvements, that's takeaway number three. Alabama is the most improved team in college football. Now, they have now clinched the SEC West title again. That's the 13th time under Nick Saban. Haven't gone to the title game 13 times under Nick Saban, but that's their 13th win of the West, whether they shared it or not. But this year's felt different. I think most everybody has kind of had their question marks. They've they've had their doubts, self-included. I've watched this team in the first month of the year. I'm like, man, there are some things that just can't get ironed out on this team. They got holes. They have issues. They have things that they need to figure out, whether it was the offensive line, inconsistent quarterback play, a secondary that against Texas was giving up big plays. is not something that you're really used to. And it was just one of those seasons where you're starting to think, man, I don't know. I don't know if this team has what it takes to maybe make a run. Well, I think you can make a pretty strong case that this has been about as well coached team as, as we've seen from Nick Saban in a while. There's a lot of question marks coming into the season as far as the coaching staff. You've had a lot of roster turnover. You've lost some really good players. One that won a Heisman Trophy. The other that got drafted third overall at defensive end. Bring in the new coordinators. You have an early season loss. You don't see a lot of September losses on the schedule. You have a quarterback revolving door in the first three weeks of the season. Well, here they are again moving forward. And they're positioning themselves not just to make to the SEC title, but they're well positioned to maybe knock off Georgia and win the SEC championship and route to the college football playoff. And this was the perfect opportunity to, to have a trap game, big emotional win, a huge emotional win against LSU. Maybe you're a little bit flat. Ask you, ask UCF and Oklahoma state how things work when you win a real emotional game the week before, and then you come out the following week and get blasted. It happens. It happens to some of the best teams in college football. It happened with Washington. Remember, they beat Oregon in the following week. They needed a defensive pick six to knock off Arizona State. This would have been a perfect opportunity for Alabama to be flat against a capable opponent that's well coached, that has good players. And it wasn't. Now, Nick Saban was comical. Some of the stuff that happened in the week leading up to the game last week, he actually put rat traps all over the facility. I haven't seen, seen them, but I've heard that there were traditional wooden rat traps all throughout the locker room, all throughout the facility to make sure that it was driven home to the players that this is an opportunity to potentially get trapped. Of course, he's talked a lot about rat poison. Well, now it's the other side of the coin. The rat poison was very much alive and well after the LSU game. Starting to talk about Jalen Milrose's development, starting to talk about this team. Hey, they may, he could get to the playoff after all. So he put, Traps all over the facility with cheese in the actual traps themselves to help drive home the message. And it was pretty clear, at least on the first possession of the first 10 minutes of the game, that 
They weren't going to be got in Lexington. They were up 21 nothing in no time whatsoever. And Jalen Milrow continued to build on what was a career game against LSU. I think you could take a step, make, take a case that maybe he was even better against Kentucky outside of the really bad decision on the interception. Uh, the interception was bad. No doubt about it. It's a bad decision. Throw it away. Live to play another down. Instead, against drop eight, tried to force one in there, and it got picked. But he was excellent with the exception of that one play. 16-23 for 240, three touchdowns, added three on the ground himself. He now has 10 total touchdowns in the last two games. In the first five games, he had 11 overall. So he's almost doubled up his output in the last two compared to what he had in the previous five. I was really a little bit concerned, too, because he took that big hit on the opening possession, clearly had some type of issue. I think it was with his thigh, was on the bike a lot. But that was something that was a little bit concerning was the hit, but it didn't affect him whatsoever. Another notable improvement on this team has been the offensive line. The offensive line was a group in the first month was really underwhelming. And remember, we talked for a while about sacks and, man, that left side, Caden Proctor, the true freshman, man, he's struggling with some of the athleticism he's seen at this level. Well, he has gotten better and better and better. And now there's been another insertion in the lineup with Jaden Roberts in at right guard, and he's been terrific since the Texas A&M game. So they've had to tweak some pieces, find their best five, and now they've found some consistency and continuity up front that has allowed this offense to take off. And then finally, the defense, which has been really strong all year, they've done a good job on that side of the ball with the exception of the Texas game. Outside of that, they have been pretty steady. Well, when you take into account what they've done in the second half of football games, that gives a lot of credence to the coaching staff. Now, Kevin Steele's the coordinator, but there's a bunch of guys on that side of the ball that deserve a ton of credit. T-Rob, Tavares Robinson is doing a great job as well, assisting Kevin Steele. And we're talking about a group that's allowed 49 second half points in the last eight games. That's six points per half. That's huge. Outside of the 74-yard run by Ramon Jefferson in garbage time, they held one of the best backs in the SEC to just 12 carries for 26 yards. It ran for only 19 yards overall if you remove the 74-yard run when the game was way out of hand. And the defense was without their best player, arguably, in the Deontay Lawson. But Jihad Campbell has filled in the last couple times that Lawson's had to miss some time, and they haven't skipped a beat. So Alabama, from where they were in week three to where they're at right now, there is not a team that has improved more significantly than the Crimson Tide. How much of that goes to Tommy Reese? I mean, this is a guy that they were getting ready to roll out of Tuscaloosa by mid-September, and now all of a sudden that offense is humming. Is that mostly Tommy Reese and his play calling, or is it Milrose development? I think it's a lot. I think it's a combination of both. The OC is not going to look great without the quarterback playing great. But I do think that there is a little bit of a process of feeling out. I mean, Tommy Reese was thrust into a situation where he had three guys with varying skill sets, all did things a little differently, And they didn't really have much of an offensive identity for a while. It was like, hey, if you can't hit the big plays, then we're in trouble, right? I mean, that was kind of it. It was boom or bust. There was very little – it was just not very methodical. Well, now Tommy Reese has a great understanding of his personnel. They have a great understanding of of what makes Jalen Milrow tick. He's being more decisive at the position too. For a while there, and we looked at some next-level stats, Jalen Milrow in the first – seven, eight games of the season was averaging 3.15 seconds before he threw the football. That's the third longest in college football. So he wasn't making real quick decisions all the time. Well, now that number's starting to come down and he's taking off when the opportunity presents itself to run the football. And he's an elite guy with the ball in his hands. He's always been that. But I think Tommy Reese deserves a lot of credit for getting to know his personnel and now putting them in a position to be really comfortable to play and perform at a crazy high level. At takeaway number four, Texas isn't perfect by any stretch, and their climb just got a lot steeper. Now, how many different times have we seen Texas in the last decade look like things are moving in the right direction? Texas is back, folks. Like We've seen and heard that over and over and over again. And I know Joe Tessitore is a loyal listener to the show. So anytime I can get Texas's back folks back into the broadcast, I'm always going to try. 
Joe's one of my best buddies, so I'm allowed to take and, and use his his comment that that will live in infamy amongst Texas fans. But we've seen that so many times. Like Texas is looking great. Here they go, and then boom, they they step in step in a hole, twist their ankle, and they're out. You know, they lose a game they shouldn't. And there have been a lot of games this year that are really uncomfortable that shouldn't have been uncomfortable. Houston, Kansas State. This week, this past week against TCU, same exact situation. But I will give Texas credit for this. In the past, when momentum swings against them, they've had a tough time of kind of getting back on that horse and surviving. I mean, I think back a year ago, Texas Tech game, big lead, two touchdown lead in great position, fumble by B. John Robinson. Texas Tech comes clawing all the way back. They push it into overtime, and then Texas Tech carries that momentum into overtime and wins the game. That could very easily have happened the last three weeks to the Longhorns, whether it was against Houston, against Kansas State, or against TCU. They wouldn't make the play down the stretch that could put the game on ice. And it was looking like in the first two quarters of this ball game in a 26 to 6 halftime lead. Things were looking pretty good. Even the third quarter, kind of a slugfest, not a whole lot to take from it. Then TCU comes alive in the fourth, and next thing you know, 20 points, including 13 in a span of about 150 seconds, uh, about two and a half minutes of game time. And next thing you know, it's like, oh boy, here we go. All of a sudden, Texas has the ball, about three minutes left, and the TCU crowd is getting hostile. I mean, they're starting to really weigh in. And Quinn Ewers, who's back in the starting lineup after the miss in the last couple of weeks, it's third and 12. They're at their own 12-yard line, and they're sitting there like, oh, boy, they don't get this one. They're going to have to punt it back. They're up three, and TCU's going to get the ball with all the momentum and the crowd behind them, and TCU's probably going to win the game. At least that's what would have happened in 22 and probably what would have happened in 2021. Well, boom, 35-yard pass to A.D. Mitchell. A.D. Mitchell beats single coverage, makes an unbelievable catch while lying on his back. Next thing you know, the game is over. It's those plays that Texas did not make for years that led to them coming up short on so many different occasions. But this year, they are making the play. Even dating back to Alabama, there was a point in which, hey, they're down three in the fourth quarter. And in about six plays, they all of a sudden went from being down three to up 11 because they flipped the switch and made the plays that needed to be made to not allow the thing to unravel in favor of their opponents. Now, here's where it could get a little bit interesting for Texas because there's one thing that I've been very intrigued by this year was the growth and development of Jonathan Brooks. He's their running back, and he is now out for the year with a torn ACL. It's significant because he's been the go-to guy for Steve Sarkeesian, and he's really allowed the offense, even though we all talked for a while about, man, how do you replace B. John Robinson? How do you replace Roshan Johnson? And the first two weeks, like, yep, yeah, they're going to miss those guys. Well, Jonathan Brooks, since week three, when he was thrust into the starting role, he's really taken off and has been one of the most productive runners in the sport. Well, he's now out. And that means they're, they're on to their next back in C.J. Baxter, who is a five-star guy universally respected with his top end talent and actually was the starter in week one and week two. But without Brooks, this room gets a little bit more thin. They still have good players. Baxter's just going to have to kind of carry a lion's share. Whereas the committee approach had been pretty beneficial to them. And honestly, knowing that Jonathan Brooks is out, man, that is a significant loss. He's an asset. He's a good player. Baxter is. But I don't know if he has the maturity. He doesn't have the maturity that Brooks has. And he hasn't been quite the spark that Brooks has been in the last seven or eight weeks of the season. So that's a notable, notable loss. It's going to make this offense rely a little bit more on the passing game and a true freshman, which can probably be a little bit uncomfortable. Hey, college football fans, whether you're on the field or in the stands, make sure you're well protected like having a solid defense to shut down that wide receiver in the final quarter, opening lanes for your running backs to do their thing, and of course, reliability when protecting your quarterback, because great coverage is a game changer. That's why Allstate provides that same protection off the field, giving you reliable coverage and game-winning protection for everything that matters, helping you stay game day ready 
every day. So get protected with Allstate. Visit Allstate.com or call a local agent today to learn more. Brought to you by Allstate. You're in good hands. Insurance coverage is subject to terms, conditions, and availability. Allstate Fire and Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, Northbrook, Illinois. Takeaway number five. Every year we try to convince ourselves that this is not the case, but we need to acknowledge what's fact. And it's not taken away from these programs. It's not saying that this program is not any good. It's just they're not elite. And we try to pretend every year like they are. That's why they start the preseason in the top six or seven only to fall off and lose to the teams they always lose to. So takeaway number five is that Penn State is closer to Ole Miss than they are to Ohio State, Michigan, and Georgia. And that's, that's not taking anything away from Penn State. They're going to be a perennial double-digit win team. You know how hard that is to do. It's outrageously difficult to create that consistency. But we continue to prop them up as if they're about to take over the college football world, and it just hasn't materialized. They've been competitive. They have pros. They have good players. They have five-star talent that's playing at several different positions, but they're not on the same level as in Ohio State, Michigan, and Georgia. And when I think about Ole Miss, okay, let's just use them as an example because I think they're comparable. I have a ton of respect for Ole Miss. I think Ole Miss is a really good, solid football team. Really solid. Really good. But when we start the preseason, we don't put Ole Miss in the top six or the top seven or the top eight. Ole Miss usually starts in the mid-15, 16, 17 area. Ole Miss has gone to New Year's Six Bowl games. They've won New Year's Six Bowl games in the last 10 years. But no one ever has them up there alongside the best programs in college football. They have to earn it. Well, Penn State, they get a ticket in the preseason to the top six or seven every year. And maybe this year was supposed to be different. Because if you look at their personnel, you got a five star quarterback recruit. You got a couple of running backs that were highly recruited a couple of years ago. You have a, a top draft pick in the NFL that plays left tackle. And yet here we are looking at the offense, and they are 102nd in the FBS in yards per play. And they're dead last in the percentage of plays that gain 20 plus yards. Well, James Franklin decided to fire. The offensive coordinator, Mike Yersich, he's been the third coordinator that's been fired by James Franklin. That joins John Donovan and Kirk Soraka. Donovan had two years. Soraka got one. Now Franklin saw Soraka during the 2020 season that was COVID and shortened and was tough. He decided to fire him in order to get the coordinator that James Franklin said he absolutely had to have. That was Mike Yersich. And Mike Yersich has not really delivered. And guess what? I look at Mike Yersich's offense when he was at Oklahoma State. It's very different from the offense that I see him running at Penn State. Very different. His whole world was perimeter run game. This guy's great on the perimeter. That's his world. That's what he did at his previous stops. Well, it didn't see a whole lot of that when he was the head coach, when he was the offensive coordinator for the Nittany Lions. James Franklin's been through five offensive coordinators since he got hired at Penn State. Mentioned the fact that he's already fired three. The next guy will be six. It's kind of crazy to me. And the offense can't seem to really get out of its own way. And I think at some point, James Franklin's, his, his back, his, his history is on the offensive side of the ball. And yet that group, Outside of them being a top 25 unit in a couple seasons under Joe Moorhead has been really inconsistent. Ricky Ronnie, he went and took the old Dominion job. Of course, Moorhead got a head coaching job as well. But we're talking about a team that's lost 13 of their past 14 against AP top 10 teams. Their last win was in the 2016 Big Ten title game. And we all know what happened in that 2016 season. It was an amazing, amazing year. They won the Big Ten. They beat Ohio State. That was a great year. And we're looking at a likely possibility of a team that's going to win against Rutgers and a team that's going to win against Michigan State to finish the season 10-2. and two. And I think it's highly likely that Penn State will find their way in a New Year's Six Bowl game because they have a couple decent wins already against Iowa and against West Virginia. But Penn State gets given the benefit of the doubt more than just about any team in America. 
And we probably need to just slow our roll on that a little bit and stop comparing them to the likes of Ohio State, Michigan, and Georgia at the moment. And we need to compare them to teams that are comparable, teams that are probably going to finish third in their division of seven teams. They're not bad. They're just not elite. And until they can consistently showcase the ability to play up to the level of the top teams in college football, they need to be like Ole Miss. They need to be like other teams that have to earn that respect as opposed to getting that respect in the preseason before letting us down. We need to adjust how we evaluate them at the moment. Does that change next year, though, with a 12-team playoff? I mean, they they don't have Michigan next year. They have Penn, or Ohio State. They have them at home. For Penn State, is the goal to just get to the playoffs and then see what you can do under Franklin? Absolutely. There will be very few teams in college football that benefit more from the new structure of the postseason. Penn State's one of those. Penn State, right now, they get the bronze medal every year in their division. But the Big Ten is doing away with divisions. If Penn State played in the West, they'd be in the Big Ten title game probably every year. But they're not. They're in the East. And because of their geographic proximity to the other teams in the East... They are in a difficult spot to be in, but they should be one of the biggest beneficiaries moving forward because they beat and in some ways run up the score on teams they're supposed to beat. But when are they going to take the next step as a program? Because the next step as a program is beating Ohio State. The next step as a program is beating Michigan. And how about taking it one step further? How about just being competitive in those games? Because you can look at the final score. Well, they lost by nine to Michigan. Oh, well, they lost by eight to Ohio State. Well, they had touchdowns at the end of the game when the game was clearly out of hand. So I I have a ton of respect for Penn State. I think they're a really good program. I just think we need to reassess who we're comparing them alongside because feels like the media is building them up to be on the same level as that of an Ohio State, Michigan, Georgia, Bama, et cetera. They're not there. They're not there right now. And the gap between those teams that I just mentioned and them is bigger than we're probably even willing to acknowledge, at least at the moment. Takeaway number six, Washington is one step closer, but this gauntlet is no joke, man. Yeah, they're 10-0. and 0. Take it. Absolutely take it. It was a good win on a windy day in Seattle against a team that's ranked in the top 20. And great teams find different ways to win. That's what I'm probably most impressed by with Washington, because on the surface, as you evaluate them from a 30,000 foot perspective, you're sitting there thinking, man, we know they got great quarterback. Okay, great quarterback. We know they have elite weapons on the perimeter at wide receiver. We know they have really good offensive tackles. We know that they've shown a willingness to be pretty good in the run game. Just see the USC game and the performance that Dylan Johnson put on tape. But one thing that's kind of lost in Washington's 10-0 start is that they have found a different way to win in the last six or seven weeks. Okay, the offense had to be lights out against SC because the defense was terrible. The offense was terrible against Arizona State, so the defense had to be lights out. This past weekend, first half, offense did their part. Not as good in the second half. But guess what? In the second half, the defense figured out a way to get it done. It was a solid game for Michael Penix. He should very much be alive in everyone's Heisman Trophy candidacy. And going to talk about the Heisman here in just a moment. He should very much be alive. Sit, goes out there, throws for 330, couple touchdowns. Stats are there for sure. And that was a Utah defense that made life pretty difficult. And weather was a factor in the game. We're talking about wind gusts over 20, 25 miles an hour. Steady winds of about 16, 17 miles an hour. That's a hard day to be effective throwing the football. And he made it happen. But it was the Washington defense that did their thing in the second half that ultimately led to the interception of Bryson Barnes in the final minute to put the game on ice. You look at what the Pac-12 has this year, it's a very diverse collection of teams. Very diverse. You have some teams that can light it up on the scoreboard. You have some teams that can't run the football. You have some teams that can throw it all over the yard. You have some teams that want to play ball control. You have some teams that want to beat you up in the trenches. It's a very diverse league. 
And Washington will adjust however they need to adjust to make sure that they get to the finish line of that specific game with more points in the opposition. It hasn't always been pretty, but you got to give credit where credit is due because that second half performance from UW's defense, which I think was terrific, absolutely terrific to shut out Utah. The way they played in the first half compared to the way they played in the second half, it was night and day. But guess what? It doesn't get a whole lot easier. You've had to survive some close games the last couple of weeks. Ever since you played against Oregon, it hasn't been real pretty. It hasn't been real convincing. Well, now in comes the Oregon State Beavers. They're going to head down to Corvallis, and that'll maybe be their toughest test to date, given the atmosphere and the quality that the Beavers have both offensively and defensively. So Washington continues to find a way, man. But goodness gracious, they are running on real thin ice at the moment. Takeaway number seven, the Heisman debate is heating up big time. Now, the leader right now in the clubhouse is Bo Nix, and understandably so. Uh, He's been really, really effective, thrown for over 3,000 yards already, has 34 touchdowns and remarkably just two interceptions. He is leading this offense in a very efficient manner. They're not making mistakes. They are putting him in a great position to hit his receivers in catch-and-run situations. A lot of their throws are not downfield. They're very methodical, and he does a great job of extending plays, being athletic, making great decisions in the pre-snap, adjusting the protection, adjusting the route, adjusting the run game. He does a lot for that team, and he is deservingly at or near the top of everyone's Heisman Trophy ballot. But there's some other guys that are starting to crash the party a bit. We know Michael Penix is in that mix as well. Michael Penix has been awesome all year long. I mean, he's got his team ranked firmly in the top five. He's been the reason why. He went toe-to-toe just a couple weeks ago with a Caleb Williams, a guy that won the Heisman Trophy a year ago. His defense didn't have their best stuff, but he just continued to deliver over and over and over again. He made some amazing plays against Oregon in leading his team back in the comeback after the fourth down stop. They go right down the field in a couple plays to score the game-winning touchdown. Michael Penix should be on everyone's list. But here's where it gets real tricky. Because on the Heisman ballot, there's only three names that you can write down. I think we know in some order, Bo Nix and Michael Penix will occupy two of those spots. Now, will you have them at one? Will you have them at two? Will you have one of them at three? It doesn't, I don't know if that necessarily matters at the moment because we're just jockeying for position at the moment. But there are two guys that also belong in the conversation for just about everybody. Let's start with Jaden Daniels. He just had, arguably, and a lot of people will say, well, how can a Heisman moment come against a team that might not even go to a bowl game? I understand that. And I, I think that, To an extent, your Heisman moment should be against top quality personnel. And Desmond Howard even said on game day, it's not about your numbers. It's about who you beat. Well, last I checked, this is an individual award. And we as Heisman voters are tasked with awarding the Heisman trophy to the most outstanding player in college football. Now, I think Bo Nix deserves a ton of consideration. I think Michael Penix deserves a ton of consideration. But just because his team is sitting at 7-3 and three doesn't mean Jaden Daniels doesn't need to be in the conversation. The guy just threw for 372 yards. He added 234 rushing yards to go along with five touchdowns and no turnovers against the Florida Gators. He's the first player in FBS history to achieve 350 passing yards and 200 rushing yards in a single game. The Tigers as a whole went for over 700. That's the most Florida has ever allowed in their program's history. And Chris Felica had a fascinating tweet that he sent out soon after the game or on Sunday morning. I don't remember exactly when it was because it was part of all the amazing different content in the timeline. Jane Daniels, leads the nation in total offense by 57 yards per game. He accounts for 408 yards a game. That's more than 80 teams. 80 out of 133. That's more than what 80 teams average this season. He's accounted for 38 touchdowns, which is more than 81 teams have scored. 
Jaden Daniels, guys, whether he wins the trophy or not, he is probably, through 10 games, the most outstanding player in college football. Now, whether or not that deserves your Heisman vote is a different conversation because everyone's criteria is a little bit different. But you'd be hard-pressed to make an argument against him. That would be my takeaway as it relates to Jaden Daniels. But don't sleep on Marvin Harrison. I know it's hard for the wide receivers to win this award. And I know a performance in which he goes for nearly 150 and a couple touchdowns against Michigan State. And he also had the rushing touchdown as well. He just became the first receiver in Ohio State history to have two 1,000-yard receiving seasons. He's going to have a big platform here in a couple weeks. And like what Desmond Howard said, maybe it's not about the numbers. It's about how you fare in the biggest games on your schedule. Well, if he goes off against Michigan, that's going to give him a pretty dang big boost because he was the difference against a bunch of teams this year, most notably Penn State. Ohio State had Marvin Harrison. Penn State did not. Ohio State won the game in convincing fashion. Marvin Harrison is also one of the most outstanding players in college football. I don't care if he plays receiver. He deserves consideration for the Heisman Trophy. Do you think Caleb Williams is going to get the invite back? Because one, his numbers are just as good as Daniels and Penix. And my other question is, like, do you think if he is, people out West are going to dilute the ballot a little bit for those finalists with Penix, Nix, and Caleb all there and take something away, maybe opening the door for some, somebody else to win it? I think it's it's possible, and the regionality of the vote does factor in. I don't think Caleb Williams is going to be a finalist. Won his final games this weekend against UCLA. And that means he will have gone two weeks from the last time the voters will have seen him. And right now, it's pretty clear who the top three or four candidates are. And I don't think there's many that would have Caleb Williams in their top four. Even though you can only vote on three, there's only three names that you can put on your ballot. I'm not sure he's in the top three. Now, if the list was five, yeah, Caleb Williams would get an awful lot of consideration on one of those five spots. But the fact that you only get to write down three names when you cast your vote makes you think he's probably going to be on the outside looking in as far as finalists are concerned. Mmm, you smell that? That's the scent of fresh turf and freshly cracked Dr. Pepper which can only mean one thing. It's college football season. So block off your Saturdays and swipe a sweet Dr. Pepper from the mini fridge because there's a new season of high kicks, long throws, and Fansville commercial breaks to carry you all the way to the West Coast games. That's right. The fans are back and this year things are heating up. We're talking about hot takes, more heartbreak, more layers of face paint, Get ready to drink in all the drama this season with the help of the most delicious college football tradition there is, Dr. Pepper, the one fans deserve. Takeaway number eight, the Big 12 race is absolutely insane. (laughs) It's so up in the air. I'm having a difficult time even comprehending how this thing's going to shake itself out. There's two weeks left, and there is a four-way tie for the second place spot in the Big 12. Here's how it happened. UCF, 45. Oklahoma State, 3. You heard that right. UCF, 45. Oklahoma State, 3. For those that paid attention to Giant Killers a little bit last week, we had another very profitable week uh, amongst the Giant Killers. UCF was our number one Giant Killer. They got it done. We're talking about a group that just recorded their first ever Big 12 home win against a team that had won five in a row. (laughs) UCF's offense was completely unstoppable. And to think that Ollie Gordon, the nation's leading rusher, had just 25 yards on 12 carries is pretty wild. Now, the loss for Oklahoma State does not mean their season's over. But as of right now, there is a four-way tie for second place in the Big 12. Between Oklahoma State, Iowa State, those two teams, it's going to be kind of interesting. Oklahoma State, Iowa State, OU, and Kansas State. It's going to be pretty interesting. Now, Texas is still at the top. 
and they're going to stay there as long as they keep winning. West Virginia and Kansas both were dealt a third loss, which means their Big Ten title, Big 12 title hopes are essentially dead. But if you look at what's left on the schedule for all of these teams, Oklahoma State has the most manageable of all the teams that are remaining. Oklahoma State is at Houston, and they get BYU at home in the final week of the season. Oklahoma goes to BYU this week, and then they have TCU at home in their final week. Iowa State, the toughest amongst the four. They have Texas this week at home, and they go to Kansas State, and then Kansas State, they're at Kansas this week, and they get Iowa State at home. Now, if the regular season ends in a three-way tie between Oklahoma State, Oklahoma, and Kansas State, the reason why we're assuming that is because we think Texas will probably beat Iowa State this week, which would give them their third loss and would ultimately eliminate them from the conversation. That's also assuming that K-State beats KU this week, and that's not a guarantee by any stretch of the equation either. But a Big 12 official actually confirmed to a beat writer that covers Oklahoma State for the Oklahoman uh, that head-to-head wins won't necessarily matter in the event in which there's a three-way tie. Oklahoma State beat Oklahoma and they beat K-State. But the reason why it won't matter is because Oklahoma and Kansas State didn't play each other which would mean it would come down to the three teams record against the highest finishing team in conference standings that all three played, which would include Iowa State, which would hurt Oklahoma State, Kansas, which would hurt OU, and UCF, which also hurts Oklahoma State, which means it might actually end up being K-State if they can win out the rest of the way. Now, the best scenario... For Oklahoma State would be a scenario in which Iowa State loses to Texas and then beat K-State because then it would get to a scenario where there's just two teams at the top, Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, and Oklahoma State would own the tiebreaker over Oklahoma because they won the head-to-head. So Oklahoma State's loss opened the door for the Sooners. They finished with 5-5 and BYU and 4-6 and TCU but they're going to need some help and the Oklahoma state to drop one here in the next two weeks for Oklahoma to ultimately get in the big 12 title game. So the big 12 conference championship race beyond Texas is insane. That's all I have to say about that. I'll be watching that closely. We'll update you the best we can when these games go final later this week. Takeaway number nine, Jimbo Fisher's dismissal was a long time coming. His opening press conference was one that a lot of people will look back to. And here's exactly how what he said as he took to the podium there after signing what was a groundbreaking and earth-shattering deal to be the head coach of the Yaggies. He said, quote, we have to understand we're not interested in being good. We're interested in being elite. We're interested in being great. End quote. Well, the best performance of the year came this past weekend against Mississippi State. A ton of talent that was on full display. <laughs> they went out and they improved their record after a 51 to 10 win over Mississippi State, 2 6 and 4. Well, they couldn't be further away from a national championship at the moment. There was a point in which Texas AM had to decide are we okay with the status quo? Because I don't think, as of right now, Texas A&M knows where they're going with the head coaching search. I wouldn't have anticipated them making a move unless they knew for sure they had a big fish on the hook. Well, according to my sources, that's not what's going on. They're going to go through the process, but they wanted to avoid the possibility of this thing snowballing in Jimbo Fisher's favor. They're now 6-4. and four. They'll be heavily favored this week to get them to seven and four and then in a win against LSU, which is certainly plausible would get them to eight and four. They win the bowl game. Now you're nine and four. And then what can you do? If you're kind of struggling in mediocrity and you're not happy with the trajectory of the program now is about the only time that you could kind of pull the trigger and decide that this was the direction that they're going to go. If you watch Texas A&M the last three years, while they had great personnel, they had great individual talent. They haven't really come within any striking distance of the SEC West title. In the last three years, Texas A&M is 19 and 15 overall, 10 and 13 against SEC competition, and 12 and 14 against Power Power 5 teams. 
That's obviously not good enough. Texas A&M is one and nine in true road games, including a nine game losing streak that has spanned for more than two years. Texas A&M is four and 10 in games decided by eight points or less, including a seven game losing streak, which is the longest of its kind in the FBS. And they were five and seven in 2022. That was their worst year since 2009. That's why they had to do what they did. Meanwhile, the recruiting continued to be really, really good. They were the number one class in 2022, maybe the greatest recruiting class of all time, according to the 247 composite. I don't know how these, I don't know how these recruiting classes stack up all time great. I don't know, but they have a roster that it would be in the top five based on the personnel that they've recruited, but they haven't been able to do enough, enough offensively. And here's one of the biggest issues. The offensive line has been a really, real, a really big problem for them the last couple of years. Really big problem the last couple of years. They're 110th in the FBS in 21 as far as pressure rate allowed, 126th in the 2022, and 128th in 2023. You know what that's going to lead to? Injured quarterbacks. And for the second consecutive year, Texas A&M was starting their third quarterback at this start of the season. Third string quarterbacks on the field is not going to amount to wins. Now, there were other at issues with Jimbo Fisher as well. His risk averse. He was a remarkably conservative, wouldn't go for it on fourth down, wouldn't call timeouts at the end of half to try to give their offense a chance to score. They had delay of game penalties that led to timeouts. There was a lot of issues that, that you need to take into account with Texas a and But Jimbo Fisher's gone. That's done. It was the correct decision, even though you got to eat an awful lot of money. And at some point, the ADs are probably going to just say, man, if you want to take that other job, you can leverage it to the gills against us, but we're not going to pay you what they're going to pay you. So if you want to go, just go. Is it embarrassing? Sure. If your coach leaves for another job, nobody wants to be Florida State and to see their head coach leave for another job. It's not a good sign at all. It's a bad sign. But now you're on the hook for $77 million for a guy not to coach your team that you got to pay out over the next eight years and you got to pay him $20 million in the next 60 days. Now, where do they go from here? Some obvious candidates that I think you need to consider. Chris Kleiman at Kansas State is the man. Absolutely love this guy. He's amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing football coach. Lance Leipold there at Kansas as well. Amazing. He's done a remarkably good job at Kansas and being able to flip the script there in an instant to get where they want to go. Oregon State's Jonathan Smith. I think is terrific. Does a great job in the run game. And with Oregon State's uncertainty in their future, it's his alma mater. So it'd be hard to leave your alma mater. But with the uncertainty about where Oregon State's going to be, what level of football are they going to be playing at? Is it time for Jonathan Smith to consider another opportunity? Then everyone seems to continue to point to Mike Elko, who everyone loved in the time that he ran the defense there in College Station, goes over to Duke, and they've done a really good job. They go nine and four last year. They're six and four right now, but every one of their four losses is coming against ranked opponents. And they've had to do so at times without Riley Leonard, who's been at less than 100% since the Notre Dame game. Another name that they could potentially consider is Jeff Trailer at UTSA. He's a Texan, former Texas high school coach, and people in the state love him. But would Texas A&M check their ego and say, you know what? Yeah, we'll hire the guy from the small school in the state or they want to go land a, light, a slightly bigger fish. That's a big question that remains to be seen. But how does this job rate at the moment? I think Texas A&M has all the resources. They have all the passion. They have the fan support. They have everything that you could possibly want. But what they don't have is a history of winning championships at the highest level on a consistent basis. That's something that is worth noting Moving forward, you can be rich as the head coach of the Texas a and but can you win championships on a consistent basis? Well, within coaching circles, everyone thinks it's a top 10 job. But I think the expectations and the historical performance are very, very different from the way I evaluate the program. It's a great job. It'll probably attract a great candidate, but they got to get this one right, especially with Texas who, whether even Texas A&M never wants to acknowledge it, they are very, very keen on what happens in Austin. There's no denying that. With Texas coming to the SEC, that pressure and that expectation level just ramped up considerably. Takeaway number 10. This is a little bit of a microcosm about what I just talked about. The SEC coaching pressure 
is on another level. It's on another level. Jimbo Fisher was just relieved of his duties. Zach Arnett, after just 10 games, Mississippi State decides to part ways with him. They just got destroyed by Texas A&M on Saturday, and they're now 4-6. and six. One of those four wins, by the way, came against Arizona earlier in the year. Arizona is firmly ranked in the top 25, probably going to be ranked in the top 20 because they're sitting there at 7-3. and three. But those are two that have already been relieved of their duties. But it goes a little bit further. People are very unhappy with Sam Pittman at Arkansas. Is he going to be the next shoe to drop? Or will things iron out a little bit for Arkansas down the stretch? I don't know. Things certainly don't look good right now for the head hog in Fayetteville. And then Billy Napier, after another loss to LSU, team might fail to get to the bowl game again. I don't think anything should happen to Billy Napier personally. The guy's only been there a couple of years. He's relying on a lot of youth. He's got a great recruiting class coming in here in the 2024 signing class. So I don't think anything should happen with Billy Napier. But then again, cooler heads are unlikely to prevail in the SEC. I'm going to give you a bonus takeaway because I'm not going to be negative. I'm not going to be negative here as we move forward because our goal here at Always College Football is to celebrate the sport. But I can promise you that I have, with the best intentions for the sport, the thing that makes the sport great is the environment that you get on a week-to-week basis in your home stadium or the environment you have going on the road and playing in a hostile environment. But you know what's bad for college football? Matchups that nobody cares about. Matchups that nobody cares about. And this week is an example why every single conference should be playing non-conference games. Every single one. Now, I know that some people will say, well, eight games in the SEC is different from that of nine games in the Pac-12 or however you want to slice it, that's fine. But we're not serving the fan when we run out Louisiana Monroe and Oxford, Mississippi to take on the Rebels. We're not serving the fan when Abilene Christian heads to College Station to take on the Aggies. We're not serving the fan when Tennessee Chattanooga heads to Tuscaloosa to take on Alabama. That's three of about eight games this year that do absolutely nothing for me as a consumer of college football. It's great that young players can can get in the game. It's great that these teams like Tennessee Chattanooga, like Abilene Christian, like North Alabama can get the money games and get the checks signed to help allow their program to continue to operate the way they want to operate. Those are great. I just want those games to be played in September. I don't want to see them played in the second to last week of the regular season. So Chattanooga to Alabama, Louisiana Monroe at Ole Miss, Abilene Christian at A&M, New Mexico State at Auburn, North Alabama at Florida State, FIU at Arkansas, Georgia State at LSU. Those games need to go away, especially here in the second to last week of the regular season because they benefit nobody. And hopefully as we move forward into the 12-team playoff era, where if you lose a game, it might not be held against you the same way it was when we had a four-team playoff or a two-team playoff before that in the BCS. So hopefully these games will go away when everyone starts to adopt the same scheduling model by playing nine conference games. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence, the confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear, more driven. That'll do it for us here at Always College Football. Continue to encourage all of you to like, to rate, and to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. If you're on Apple Podcast, if you could leave us a rating, if you could leave us a review, it'd mean a lot to us. If you're on Spotify, leave us a rating. Whatever podcast platform you're on, subscribe, man. We're going to be back here on Wednesday. We'll be back here on Thursday to preview this weekend's slate of games. Then we'll be back on Monday. We'll be back on Sunday with our initial takeaways. And we will continue forth here as we begin to put a bow on what's been a terrific 2023 season. For all of us here at Always College Football, for Mark, Jake, Jack, Jack, and Devon, who's with us for the very first time. Welcome to the Omaha family, Devon. We appreciate you, my friend. For all of us here at Always College Football, we appreciate you, and we look forward to being back with you here in just a couple days. Remember, it's Always College Football. Hey, guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.